So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is with a strange combination of shock, joy, and sadness that I find myself now introducing the last of our speakers of the Mellon Sawyer Seminar. Uh, and in that respect, it's very fitting that the last speaker will be Mellon co-PI Catherine Takow. Professor Takow has a BA from Oberlin and a PhD in Medieval Studies from the University of Wisconsin. After positions at Montana State in Pomona, Catherine joined the History Department at Iowa in 1986. She has published widely at the intersection of medieval science, philosophy, and religion with the materiality of text and image. Her first book, Vision and Certitude in the Age of Occam, Optics, Epistemology, and the Foundations of Semantics, won the Medieval Academy of America's John Nicholas Brown Prize. Her current work focuses on the intellectual environment of the University of Paris and its formative documents. Catherine has held numerous fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Humanities Center, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the Institute for Advanced Study. And I understand that she will be in Uruguay uh, next year as well with a Fulbright. Uh, Catherine has also played an active role in faculty leadership serving as Iowa's Faculty Senate President and as the head of the local chapter of the AAUP and has recently been appointed to the National Council on the Arts and Humanities. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming our final speaker of the seminar. Thank you, Paul, for the lovely introduction. Is it this one that's on? That's fine. OK. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you all about one of my passions in uh, medieval book production, a moment that I think of as a moment of great change. Whoops. Let's see how we get this to move. Um, we now know, those of us who are, study Europe, that contrary to our long-standing rumor, the Europeans did not invent printing. They didn't invent movable type. There is at least one aspect of European printing press that seems so obvious for its efficiency, however, that we tend to overlook its importance. It tells us a lot about manuscript production leading up to the development of the press, not as a revolution, but as an extension of manuscript production. So the question is, how did we get to the imposition of multiple pages per sheet in printing? So you have a late 15th century woodcut here. It shows two pages per side. And a 16th century engraving that shows four pages per side. So that's what I mean by imposition, for those of you for whom that's a new term. And the answer, in short, which I'm going to show you, is what is often called the Pecchia system of book production. But I think it's useful to make a distinction between a Pecchia system and a Pecchia method of copying. The word Pecchia, which is spelled different ways in different countries and times, sometimes Petia, is actually our word peace. That's what it meant. Uh, and it's common in many different uses. One is a small plot of land that seems to be among its earliest uses. Uh, and so the Peckia method of copying is to copy a book one piece at a time, whatever a piece is. And what that meant was that uh, usually this is a quaternion, but it might be a full hide of an animal divided into uh, or folded into separate parts, maybe cut, maybe not cut. We'll discuss that. But in any case, instead of binding the book, it was uh, available as an unbound exemplar of Pecchia's 
And these were possessed by the stationarius or a stationer who was the owner and renter of exemplars. And there are many stages in development of this process, I think, over time that went from it being a method of copying one piece at a time to a much more formal system where after it had become common for stationarii to have these exemplars uh, in towns where there were uh, large numbers of students and professors, as the universities were founded, the universities attempted to exert control over the exemplar, requiring that these be correct, uh, sometimes listing rental price lists or the number of lines that there should be per page and so on. And we know for sure that that has occurred when there's a university statute. But there are many different kinds of informal evidence as to the method at least being used, even if we don't have a full-fledged system as has been defined of university control over the process. And there's also the possibility that there were analogous systems in religious orders, specifically first the Franciscans and Dominicans who had a vested interest in spreading their education very widely across their international network of schools. So when I'm talking about Pecchia production, I'm going to be talking primarily about the Pecchia method. And um, as opposed from assuming that only when we have a Pecchia system is there something important to talk about. So the first question is about scribes. As we have um, alluded to several times this year, between, say, the 6th century of the Common Era and the 12th century of the Common Era, the majority of manuscripts that were copied in uh, Latin reading Europe were copied by male or female monks in their monasteries. This, <clears throat> very few of them do we have names for, but some of them had a bit more ego than others. This is an alleged self-portrait by Aodwin, the Prince of Scribes, as he calls himself. <laughs> You'll see he's seated in a chair. Uh, this would be a cathedra, um, very much like the one that um, Hugh of San Victor sat in in the earlier talk. And in front of him, he has some kind of a writing stand that's draped with a cloth. He has a bound book in which he is copying with a quill in his right hand and a pen knife or a uh, knife in his left hand. And these are the implements that allow us in an image to identify a scribe, the knife and the quill. They are his attributes very much as Catherine's wheel is an attribute that allows you to identify St. Catherine or the grill allows you to uh, identify St. Lawrence who got roasted on it. So it doesn't automatically tell us that monks were writing into bound books. But it's a very common image and when the person is also an author, it's almost always a bound book. But that doesn't mean that the person took out the kind of bound book that we can get today that's got blank pages and wrote in it. So the first question is, how did scribes actually copy? And their images might be helpful, but as I've just said, they may be misleading because it's easy to confuse attributes for actuality. Um, on the left, we have an image from uh, 13th century France, northern France, probably Paris, of a vernacular manuscript, and it shows a scribe seated in a chair with a pivoting writing stand. We see lots of images of those, and I think uh, I've read that 
uh, one may have been found, but in any case, those, something like that seems to have existed. He had some kind of green cloth on the desk, on his writing stand. It seems to have been bolted down somehow, and on that he has an open bifolium that is held down by two little weights. And in front of him he has what initially looks like another bifolium on a stand, but it's held by something larger and stronger, and it has this curved lip, so it's probably an open book. So it shows him copying from a bound book, as do most images that show copying from something that I've found. This one is from the mid-14th century. It's, by, it's a fresco by Tommaso da Modena uh, in Treviso at a convent where he's showing all sorts of famous Dominicans for the brothers who will live there and take them as models. And again, this shows somebody writing on an open bifolium. He's got some kind of paper or parchment uh, under his hand to protect the ink of what he's already written. He's got an open book from which he may be copying. And he does have eyeglasses, which, unlike many things we've discussed, was a European invention. So we think mostly books were copied one at a time from start to finish in those monasteries up until, say, the 12th century. But we do have some evidence that occasionally, for good reason, there would be simultaneous copying of separate choirs or sections in monasteries. And among the most famous example are some books copied by the nuns of Shell uh, at about the year 800, where the head of the scriptorium had obviously divided out the book choir by choir and handed each to a nun to copy so that the book could, the copy could be produced much more quickly. So we can see here that this uh, sheet has the scribe's uh, identifier. It's not actually a colophon. It just says Eusebia scripts it. Eusebia wrote this. And it tells us that this is Quaterna 36. And then we have another sheet that has the scribe Gisla Drudis, who has written it, and it's the uh, 28th uh, Quaternus. So it seems to be really the 12th century demand for textbooks that led to the possibility of there being a market for more rapidly co copied books. Um, probably principally for initially for teachers and for people who had gotten enough learning that when they were promoted to abbot or bishop they wanted to take a fancy copy of the glossed Bible or uh, another work of learning with them to their new monastery. And there are various different kinds of textbooks that enter the scene at that point. The first that we think it is likely to have inspired a need to copy more quickly in a standard format is Gratian's Decretum. This is a 12th century copy made um, presumably in Bologna. Am I right? I have to double check because I can't see the script clearly from here. Uh, I think that's right, but in any case, that's the most likely place for a 12th century uh, copy of the Decretum. We have uh, one of the many kinds of works that came into the Latin West in the 12th century in the wave of translation that Eric Quackle was discussing, namely um, uh, mathematical as astronomical, logical works. This is Adelard of Bath's translation of um, uh, Al-Khwarizmi's arithmetic book, and I'm sure you can't see it, 
but right here it's displaying um, Arabic numerals. So this is the means by which Hindu numerals came to Europe starting in the 12th century, or I should say Latin reading Europe. It had been there, they had been there a long time in Spain and Sicily. And finally, a glossed Bible. That's a specific shape of a Bible. It is prepared with glosses written. It may also have margins for personal glosses to be added. But it has a, uh, a set of glosses built in. It's more or less a library of biblical interpretation passage by passage. The demand arose in cities where there were large numbers of students and teachers, numbers that hadn't been seen since antiquity, if ever. And this meant that the monasteries there were incapable of supplying as many books as people wanted. Of course, some of the monasteries would keep copies and they would be available to read in their libraries, at least for the members of the religious house. But there came to be huge demand. And that same demand that was formed by students and teachers coming together led to the reinvigoration um, of the study of Roman law and the students at Bologna got the idea from Roman law of a corporation. This was an idea that was being uh, found to be useful by many sectors of Italian society. <clears throat> But the corporation, of course, is a fictional body. It comes from the same word corpus as corpse does. And any profession that had a profession in common that they might want to protect their standards, the entry into the profession, the competition, and so forth, was likely at this point to form itself into a guild. The Latin word most commonly used for guild was universitas, and the students in Bologna got the brilliant idea that they had a profession in common, studying, and they formed a couple of universities, one for the people from beyond the Alps and one from those from nearby. And part of their purpose was to control their teachers and make sure their teachers taught everything that was on the syllabus, not too fast, not too slow. Um, but these were law students, so they were probably people in their late teens, early 20s. The idea spread north of the Alps to Paris, and from Paris to Oxford, it spread around Europe. In Paris, it was people of a similar age that formed the, cor the corporation, but they were masters of arts. So the model for European universities north of the Alps was master-led, uh, university south of the Alps and with the conquest of the New World into the New World, it was student-led universities. So we don't know when the universities are actually founded. We know when they get standing to defend their rights and privileges in somebody's court. And so for Paris, we know it had formed by 1210, in Oxford in the 1220s, but there were huge numbers of students and teachers, with teachers gradually forming guilds in the north in order to cut down on the entrepreneurial competition among each other. So the formation of a university comes at a certain end point of growth. And by the time we get to a guild, various kinds of aspects of university life have begun to develop, and one of them is the use of books, the teaching of books, the development of, the initial development of a curriculum. So here's the first university at Bologna. And although I think there's still some debate about it, it's likely that the system of copying by Pecchia first arose at Bologna, uh, where there was the need for rap more rapid copies, not only of the civil law code of Justinian and the comp the of, not precisely official uh, commentaries on it, but certainly the standard commentaries on it, and of Gratian's Decretum, the uh, canon law equivalent 
but I don't know a lot about the details of uh, book production in Bologna beyond the fact that we do know the names of some stationers, we do know the names of some uh, uh, scribes, we've got some documents that tell us about the Pecchia method and we've got lots of reasons for thinking that it uh, arose first in Italy and probably at Bologna. But we do know a lot about the rise of book production in Paris. So I want to turn to Paris um, because I think that mutatis mutandis, things were probably to some extent similar in Bologna. Paris benefited, however, from the fact of having, from the t late 12th century on, the increasing presence of the King of France, who had up to that point been much more itinerant, as most kings were, who settled permanently in Paris with uh, movement outside of Paris and kept his archives there, and that meant that most of his major ecclesiastical officials, the abbots and bishops of important abbeys and uh, cathedrals also came to Paris and set up mansions there so that they could be present when the king was. And that created a large number of potential patrons of luxury books at the northwest end of the Ile de la Cité, around the Palace of the King, a smaller number on the right bank and a large number on the left bank. In addition, at the southeast corner, we have the Cathedral of Notre Dame, which had a preeminent school of, uh, cathedral school up to that point, <clears throat> and also, also had a steady demand for books. So thanks to various scholars, we know a lot about the book trades in Paris that eventually would have streets on the left bank name for them, um, but that seem to have been densest right here between the two major centers of, of wealthy patronage of the exceptional books and within reach of the students and faculty who would have provided the daily labor for most other books. So here's the parvis of Notre Dame, the place in front of it. We know that the book binders were there. Along the new street of Notre Dame, the Rue Neuve Notre Dame, were the parchmenters, the scribes, the stationers, and the illuminators. Sometimes those were the same person. Right along here, on the Petit Pont, we know that there were shops as there were on most bridges in that period in Europe. And in the upper reaches above, there were sometimes teachers and students, but on the lower end and right up to the corner of the street with all the book arts were the especiers or apothecaries, which is where the artists would have gotten their um, their materials, most of their materials for making pigments. It's where physicians would have gotten their materia medica, and it's where people interested in alchemy would have gotten their materials, plus everything else that was a foreign import or expensive. And then up here by the Pont aux Changeurs is where the money changers were, that's its why it has its name, but it's also where the goldsmiths were. And one of the things in luxury books that made Paris distinctive was how early they began using gold leaf in illuminations. It's one of the indicators that we have that there is a, um, a distinctive Parisian style. Now, I mentioned all these people being along the, these streets. They are lay people. They are not monks. And those different professions probably evolved rather slowly. We certainly see indications of them in manuscripts. This is a rather famous um, image from a famous manuscript in Copenhagen. This is a parchment maker, presumably because it shows the frame on which the parchment was made, as well as the rolls he's selling to a monk. Um, 
But at some point, the person called a parchmenter was no longer the maker, he was the seller. And simply the seller, and he might branch out into owning the Pecchia exemplars from which books would be copied. We know he's a lay person because of this kind of hat that he wears. Uh, I don't know if they wore them every day, but it was a pretty uh, good attribute that identifies uh, a lay artisan. Certainly from about the first decade of the 13th century, lay scribes, show, lay scribes show up with some frequency in images. Uh, this is my favorite. It's, uh, what, it's an image that brought me into this whole issue of the production of books at Paris. Um, it comes from a luxury book that was made for the uh, royal family that has gold leaf in the background of thousands of images. Uh, that are arranged in pairs to explain the Bible text's meaning for the present day, which is how modern day Protestants understand the Bible to be, but it wasn't how people always used the Bible. And so the top roundel and text always have a summary and interpretation of a passage of the Bible, and below is the interpretation into modern day meaning. So up here we have an image showing uh, David and his soldiers. David was not yet King David, but David and his soldiers buying weapons from the hereditary enemies of the uh, uh, Israelites, namely the Philistines, who we see here at the forge making the weapons and selling them, and below, arranged in parallel structures, parallel groups. We have people with tonsured heads, which means they're clergy, so they're scholars in this case, throwing a book over their shoulder or ignoring it behind them on a stand and buying books from a scribe who has that same kind of head cap and has the knife in one hand and the pen in the other that tells us he is the scribe. He's got a rather ugly face. This roundel is this big, so a lot of art crammed into a small place. The text is wonderful. It says that just as the sons of Israel went to the Saracens to get their uh, weapons, that signifies the bad scholars who leave their study of the Gospels and head off to Bologna <laughs> to study law and decretals and uh, basically God's going to confound and destroy them. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that at Paris they thought of Bologna as where you go to study the decretals and where you buy books of the decretals made by lay scribes. But presumably since this book was made in Paris, the illuminators had seen lay bookmakers. One of the earliest dated university texts produced in Paris is the Almagest, copy of uh, the Almagest known as the Almagest of the Sorbonne which is dated 1213 and it's colophon, which says this book was written and completed from the exemplar at uh, St. Victor in Paris in this year in the month of December. St. Victor was a monastery where we have lots of evidence that some of this transition between complete monastic autonomy in producing their books and interaction with the lay community uh, to augment their own uh, scriptorium was occurring. It's actually art historians who've made a huge contribution to understanding the development of these lay workshops because some of the lay uh, illuminators or owners of illuminators workshops show up very early. 
So it's a reminder that those of us who are interested in paleography need to learn the contemporary art history. Um, the first such illuminator whose name we know and we don't actually know whether he also um, was the scribe. <clears throat> but in any case, the first one we know was a master, Alexander. And we can date him because he, he um, illuminators tended to make frequently used rote images, sort of a workshop specialty that they could use on demand for a customized book for somebody who didn't want a lot of images but might, at the beginning of the Bible, want the seven days of creation. And so I've identified several different traditions of those seven days of creation. And Master Alexander has this one that shows, sometimes show, shows God at the beginning seated on his throne, but usually starts with him. Uh, at the beginning of the creation of the world above the clouds. And so we see that again in another manuscript. This one belonged to Hugh of Chateauroux. And a third one, uh, I'm sorry, this one on the right did not belong to Hugh of Chateauroux, but this one in the center did. It's a glossed Bible. Uh, and we see basically the same uh, imagery with slight variation. So we know that Master Alexander's atelier was flourishing at a particular time, the first two or three decades of the 13th century. So once we have lay booksellers, they would quickly have seen the advantages of owning an exemplar, keeping it in separate pieces, and then renting as many of those pieces simultaneously to different scribes for a fee, regathering them, renting them out to other people as long as possible and as often as possible. And sometimes, as at Bologna, we had stationers who had more than one exemplar of the most important text. So we also know there was demand for it. And we can you, we know a lot about this system of renting it by Pecias, even before there are universities trying to uh, exert control over it, because of two kinds of indications. One are explicit Pecia indications that a manuscript was copied by Pecia. So one kind is what's over here in the margin of this manuscript. It just says second Pecia. Or here, it says the end of the 30th Petya. Or, you've seen this image today, this contains 20 Petya. Or, in Paris, um, for the exemplar of this book, I paid uh, 30 Parisian whatever, sous probably, and it, for it contains 30 pecchia, which tells us that we, it was about one of these units per pecchia. There are also implicit pecchia indications. This is a rather famous manuscript of Thomas Aquinas's work. It has explicit pecchia indications over in the margin. Here it says 4p, meaning the fourth pecchia, and it has some dots showing where that probably should start. We find those here and then down here in the bottom we have the implicit Pecchia indication, which is the extra text written below. That's because if a stationer is successfully renting several Pecchia at once to different scribes, they're not necessarily copying in the same order and they're copying what they read, not what they see. Which means that if a text is highly abbreviated, they will be reading in their minds what the word is, and they'll sometimes abbreviate and sometimes not, or they'll use a different current abbreviation. So they won't get precisely the same number of letters per line. So imagine you have just copied Pecchiae 1 and 2, and you want to copy Pecchiae 3, and it's out. <clears throat> 
You calculate what your normal space is per pecchia, and you prepare to start the next pecchia you can get at four, and you start there. And then lo and behold, it turns out you didn't leave enough space. This is what you do, right? So it's not an infallible guide to whether something was copied by Pecchia. And that's why it's helpful to have both explicit and implicit Pecchia indications to see if something was copied that way. An awful lot of manuscripts that don't have Pecchia indications do have precisely this same kind of problem show up. So this is one a manuscript of Peter Oriel. He's a 14th century author. You can see that there's a lot of text that's been put in here in the margin. It might be a commentary. But then you notice the change in letter size, right? Where suddenly not enough room has been left, right? So my assumption would be perhaps Pecchia copying. As it happens, we know that Oriel's work was copied by Pecchia. And so even though this manuscript doesn't contain any Pecchia signs, uh, my guess is that uh, this kind of indication is another way of being reminded of that form of copying. So the question is, how many of those manuscripts with this kind of implicit Pecchia signs actually were copied by Pecchia? We don't know. We've been very conservative in thinking of it as pretty much requiring explicit Pecchia signs to know. We also get evidence of scribal correction from an exemplar. The most common text in the uh, theological uh, faculties was the work of sentences of Peter Lombard. And here's the uh, blow up. You may just be able to see that there's writing here. That's from down here. And it says, usque hook correctam puto literam huius libri primi. Up to this point, I think the writing of this first book is correct or has been corrected. In fact, it's not because I checked this um, rubric against the critical edition and its variants, and it's not correct. But it may have been copied correctly from the exemplar they had. So when we don't have the exemplar, we don't always know what it looked like, how correct it was. Maybe that's a better shot. We get lots of evidence of scribal frustration with error-filled exemplars. This is one I really like. It's been used as the front of a book on copying by exemplars and Pecchia. It says, this title is badly corrected in the exemplar. In other words, don't blame me if I got it wrong. <laughs> And we sometimes get the names of the uh, stationer who owns the, the exemplars that people are copying from. This is the Liber Sextus, which is a major work of canon law. Uh, and it uh, began to be used in the early 14th century. So it already provides us uh, a date after which something has occurred, because we know when Pope Boniface VIII uh, promulgated it. And here it says, um, this was done through the, or with, or by means of the Pecchias of Walter Efficox, Gualteri Efficox, who we know was a stationer in Bologna. And that's because at, a, at Bologna, at least, several stationers would have exemplars of the same work. And the uh, university required that they be of the same length with the same number of uh, lines per page, the same number of sections of each work down to the lowest uh, common section, so that 
if you went to Walter uh, efficiency uh, and his Pekia was not there, you could go get the equivalent one from somebody down the street who had the uh, Pekia. Okay, so then we ask what did the exemplars that the um, stationers had look like? Well, some of them have survived. They tend to be um, written large across what would normally be a bifolium, the ones that we've seen. They, they're different shapes to them. I haven't examined all that many. Um, but you can see that this was originally uh, two sheets, and it's now bound in a book binding. That, so it is double the size of each individual's folio. And they have certain things in common. Up here, they tell which pechia it is, uh, which number it is uh, down here. So here's the pechia, and it says book two of the sentences. And this says Alexan and has the abbreviation. It probably means it's from the sentences of somebody named Alexander. Uh, there are two possibilities of who that could be. I haven't checked. And down here, it says core for correxit or correcta or uh, correctum or whatever the word was, meaning it's been checked. It's correct. And you can see it's pretty, it's uh, not necessarily clean parchment. It was sort of rough grade parchment. It had to be durable. And um, the question then is how many bifolia were in this pechia that were rented out? This is in the inner cover. So that, uh, and each of the current sheets is the size of one half of this. We know sometimes about the universities control or the presence of stationarii with um, uh, exemplars because they show up in statutes. I think the three earliest that we uh, statutes that we know about are at Vercelli before 1228 and that was when Vercelli was founded by masters who had just left Padua and were trying to set up a new university and they had just gotten to Padua a few years before from Bologna. So there wasn't time at Padua for this system to be, have been invented. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we think that Bologna is where it was established. Uh, in Salamanca in 1254, when Alfonso the Wise founded the university, uh, he granted them a great charter and he required that the university have a stationer whom he would pay a certain amount per year and who in return guaranteed that he would have his exemplars all be good ones and correct ones. And then we finally have uh, a, a statute at Padua long after we have books being copied by Pe Pecchia there. We also have various kinds of literary evidence of the existence of stationers and exemplars. Um, one of the most often misquoted ones is this one from Roger Bacon, who tends to exaggerate everything um, except his own brilliance, which he thinks is understated. Um, one thing he really despises is women. He's got a whole treatise on um, how you can live to a long age if you glance low and never look in the eyes of a woman and get seduced by her because women shorten your life. Um, so that informs my reading of this. <laughs> he starts out by saying that there are a lot of good exemplars of the uh, Vulgate to be had in various monasteries in Paris and the surrounding regions and that smart people want to know what the truth of the text is, should go check those, not the one that's circulating in Paris. And 
He's referring back to uh, a version that scholars today think of as the Great Paris Bible, the Great Revision of the Bible. He had nothing but contempt for it. And so he says, about 40 years ago, an innumerable multitude, he actually says infinite, so I'm not taking him literally, an innumerable multitude of theologians and Par Parisian stationers produced a new exemplar of the Vulgate. But because they were illiterate, which they can't have been, so <laughs> we know that's an exaggeration, and married, which explains why he thinks they're illiterate, and neither cared nor knew how to think about the truth of sacred text, they produced an extremely untrustworthy exemplar. And the numerous scribes who copied it added their own changes, corrupting the text further. <clears throat> Thereafter, more recent theologians who hadn't examined the exemplar initially trusted the stationers. But afterwards, the theologians began to notice all the errors. One of the controversies in the field is whether the Peccia system ever existed at Oxford. Certainly, there are Peccia manuscripts from Oxford. So if we ask instead, have we got the Peccia method and lay stationers in Oxford, we certainly have evidence from what uh, at least some theologians say that, they, that it existed and that they knew it. One who's very useful is Robert Holcott, a Dominican who's commentary on wisdom was copied by Peccia, uh, which he didn't know when he wrote it, of course. And he describes a system that can only have come from England because he was never outside of England, so far as we know. And he said, just as control of the body comes from the head and a stream gets its water from its source, so a scribe obtains what he writes from the exemplar. For that reason, if the exemplar should be incorrect and false, the scribe cannot be faulted for writing an error-filled book. Stationarii, therefore, should take care that their exemplars from which the scribes will make copies are correct. And we know his was copied by Peccia because of the explicit Peccia marks. So I don't think we've looked systematically always for this kind of evidence, but if anybody finds it in somebody's work, what they refer to stationers owning exemplars, which they have to keep corrected, so scribes will have it correct. They, if they weren't quoting Holcott, they knew the Peccia system. So uh, I can't claim it's a dissertation topic, but it might be an article topic. In fact, it's one I've been trying to write for years, but I never get around to it. So I pass it along to whoever wants. OK. So how did scribes actually write? That's not clear. Uh, we see in this same manuscript from Copenhagen a scribe lining the bifolium all the way across. And here I've doctored it a little so you may be able to see where the lines are to see that what he's showing is exactly what in another manuscript is the general pattern. And again, this may be a book that was designed to have somebody add their own glosses to it or their notes or uh, whatever. Um, so we know that they were familiar with bifolia. We have that later image from the mid 14th century of somebody writing in an open bifolium with uh, some surface between himself and what he's already written to keep from smearing it. So did scribes copy from or onto folded but uncut choirs? Well, possibly yes. This seems to be uh, evidence of this. This is a painting of St. Mark writing his gospel. It's from the 16th century. It's currently in Munster. Uh, and here this text is written facing the viewer, and this text is written facing him. So that's definitely got is uh, folded into four parts, and it's being written in different directions. <clears throat> 
So it's possible. And we do have some surviving, uncut uh, manuscripts that were clearly exemplars that were divided that, that were written that way, um, imposed on the sheet, left uncut, folded, and that one would have to unfold at least in part in order to copy each of the, in this case, 16 sides. Certainly, we've got some of the more common format of those that are folded and would have had four sides, or if they were cut, had a little tab left to keep them hooked together so they didn't get separated. And that still exists in the 15th century when the printing press comes in and uses the same model. But that tells us the problem with that image before. This is the 16th century. So is that actually how scribes wrote? Or is the painter assuming that they did because that's how books were printed and they encountered those kinds of folded sheets from time to time, which they were busy binding into the bindings of books. We don't know, but I think the evidence is pretty good that at least some of the time it was convenient to copy from uncut choirs. The fact that we have some extant um, exemplars with uncut choirs that have many sides seems to indicate they survived being copied that way. So I think it's fair to say that it's uh, in the shops of the lay stationers who wanted their, not only their exemplars to come back to them, but to come back to them in one piece, who developed that system of having, renting out imposed sheets and not cutting them, and that therefore scribes found a way to use them, folding and refolding as they went. And that brings us back to where we started, the modern imposed sheet in the printing press. This is from a, a relatively recent 20th century critical edition. Um, it, normally, I pass out a copy to my paleography classes who will recognize it, um, but it's getting frayed now. But it was used as packaging when I was sent copies of a different critical edition because these were extra uh, sheets that had been printed and were no longer used. So I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. I, w I wonder if the Pekia ever crossed the line between book production and craftsmanship to scholars saying, you know what I mean, Pekia three, something like that. Uh, in other words, using it as a textual reference. I don't think so because where they divided was often arbitrary. Um, or at least when the exemplar was made, if another was copied from it, it had to be identical if it was a law book. Um, but no, they don't tend to quote that way. And it's even, I can't think of through the 14th century, anybody copying by, uh, uh, citing by page. What they tend to do is cite by certain words or in a legal text, they've got a way of citing code chapter whatever the parts are, and then the first few words. So I, it would be simple. Uh, Eric, have you ever run into that kind of quoting by page or by Pecchio? Uh, <clears throat> no, because um, most scribes, because the notation Pecchio is so rare, did not take it, you know, just copied it and didn't. So that was a bit haphazard, all yeah. of it. Um, so this, most Pekia manuscripts copied from a Pekia exemplar don't have in the margins the numbers, 
so it would be impossible to reference and and would probably not be assumed that somebody who you were in discussion with had that based on the fact that most of them don't today also the pecky numbers are on the far margins they're often cut off they can be written not in ink but in uh, pencil or actually lead point or whatever that was they were using so um, it's a term of it, it's a it's not as likely a reference point as just being able to add page numbers and what does happen in the 14th century is some uh, authors start numbering at specific lengths down the middle co of two columns uh, every fifth line uh, they will go a b c d e in the hope of being able to cite more precisely there's, there's another reason why it's not likely because um, there's often more than one Pekia exemplar and uh, the choir breaks which was the natural end of the Pekia will not have been the same in these these different exemplars right. and so what's Pekia 1 coming from exemplar X is not Pekia well one will be the same but Pe <laughs> Pekia 14 is not the same in those two uh, exemplars so the it only works if if you're on a the same branch of of a tradition if you see what I mean. Although, you, Catherine, you were saying there, there was somewhat s standardized. Well, where, in where Bologna, there are statutes requiring that they be. But, but there's like often a huge gap practice. between yeah. what the law states and what actually happens. <laughs> um, you were saying that you had only examined a few exemplars, uh, that you hadn't examined many. Um, I, I, have, I haven't run across personally so, many of the exemplars that are known. Oh, so are, it, are there few exemplars known, or is it, is it just that you haven't personally looked at closely at them? I haven't personally looked closely at them. Oh, okay. okay. I mean, they're more known than we expected, than one mm -hmm. would expect. Um, uh, but... Um, the exemplars, as opposed to the Pecchia copies, are really, I think, no more than 80 or something like that last I read. But I was just wondering, because it, it, looking at the exemplars, they're not in a traditional form to be bound. Right. So if they, you know, if they were ever found as ended up as binder's waste, or if people had examined binder's waste to find exemplars or anything, or if you knew anything about that. Well, um, those, that particular exemplar I showed you and several that I've seen described like that were clearly not of this kind of imposition, mm -hmm. right? Because they are big to be easily viewed, yeah. maybe to be clipped on something so they could be read. Um, and, um, but I don't know that all exemplars were like that. I don't. Um, uh, I do have the major studies on it, but it's one thing to read somebody's description. It's mm -hmm. another thing to look, look at, at it and see if if it makes if the description makes the sense mm -hmm. you thought it made. Yeah. So. Catherine, I'm just curious to ask if, uh, from your perspective the arrival of European-made paper around 1300 uh, impacted the, not just the use of the Pecchia system, but the, the growth of the university system. I mean, there, are there big changes that occur about that time based on the more ready availability of paper? Poor students being able to be part of the university system, maybe, I don't know. I'm just curious about your sense of that moment in time. Um. Well, at the early 14th century, the, the earliest man, it, let me back up one step. Most of the manuscripts I have looked at have been from scholars in the upper faculties, that is the people who've had enough money and enough time to go through, get all the way to an MA and then start studying either law, theology, or medicine. And primarily medicine, though I have, have looked from time to time at various other kinds of texts. Before the 13th century, I don't remember seeing paper in my manuscripts. 
They may have been used in arts faculty manuscripts occasionally, I don't know. Then they start showing up as a choir or two in by say 1330 or 1340. By the end of the century, theologians are having copies made on paper of their manuscripts and it's much, I mean, there are still a lot of parchment copies, but there are a noticeable number of parts of, a, of uh, uh, paper copies. The earliest paper copy I'm sure that I've seen uh, was one that couldn't have been before 1310 when it was composed and that was a logic text by a Parisian master. Uh, and that was what taught me to look at the material. I was with Paul Oscar Christeller and we were looking at this manuscript and um, I identified the author by a real fluke since he wasn't named in it. Um, and he said, what's it written on? And I hadn't even noticed that it wasn't parchment yet. And so, uh, one of the great codicology lessons of my life lasted two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it did make it possible for people in the lower faculties and poorer students in the advanced faculties to have books. That would be my guess. Catherine, do you think that the rise of the Pecchia system led to an increased concern over the authority of the exemplar than you otherwise had in manuscript production? And if so, why? And also, if so, what was the criterion for authority? So in other words, if it was a newly produced work, would it have been the autograph of the author? Or um, I think people always knew that every scribe or almost every scribe made mistakes. I say almost every because, of course, I don't. <laughs> uh, but they knew that, and there were various attempts over the course of um, uh, history in the Latin reading world to gather together copies of the Bible and revise it and try and get back to an original, authentic version. Uh, when you have the Pecchia method deployed, I think the chief reason that uh, universities try to gain control over it is because they are worried about the accuracy of the text and they usually have an appointed commission of people who are supposed to guarantee that it's accurate. Um, there's some doubt as to whether they performed their commission. Um, I'm sure it would have been tedious to do it right for all the exemplars. So I think the concern arose not because people had a new um, notion that copies could be false, but because people were showing up in debates saying, that's not what the Bible says, it says this, or that's not what Gratian says, it says this. And they had trouble reconciling who had it right. Most people were probably dealing with memory and had capacious memories and had memorized an enormous amount. So sometimes people would have simply been wrong. But a lot of times there are quite clear divergences. Uh, I've noticed a couple in my work on the Bible Moralise. One is when Noah is trying to see if the 40-day flood has receded, he sends out a series of birds. And there's the imagery almost always shows a raven or crow having returned and floating on a carcass uh, in the water. And the text almost always says that the crow did not return. And this turns out to be a dispute in what is the correct text of the Bible that goes all the way back to Josephus, if not earlier, which Roger Bacon comments on, that the text says that it doesn't return, but everybody knew that it did return because that's what the images that they always saw showed them. So they kept making an image showing the returned raven on top of a carcass, which was Augustine's addition to the explanation. Um, so it, what does develop with the university is the notion that there is an authority, the corporation. 
the group of, of experts, the group of masters. And that shows up in lots of different ways, such as people saying, uh, I'm holding this opinion subject to the greater opinion of the masters, right? So that that's what they were trying to do, was, was try to root out the errors they knew had to be there. Can I just ask about a side issue? From reading, uh, going back to the Alma guest, uh -huh. from reading Chaucer, I have the idea that that's a book everybody knew was, every, everybody knew all about it, but they never read it. Now I wonder, true. Are, are the copies really in good condition normally? Um, there were certainly some specialists who were really interested in astronomy who read it. Roger Bacon quotes significant portions of it. Uh, he was a voracious reader. But that's why there were other books, such as Sacro Bosco's De Sfera and, and Campanus of Novara's De Sfera that were there. They were compendia that made it easier for somebody who had to have enough expertise to cast a horoscope, which physicians often needed to do, uh, but didn't really want to contribute to the advance of um, astronomical knowledge. So it fits Mark Twain's definition of a classic book everybody wants to have read, but nobody wants to read. <laughs> Thank you.